Hello and welcome to Grade 10 Chemistry. In this unit, we'll be covering the following concepts. What makes elements bond together to form compounds? The six different types of naming conventions or nomenclature for compounds. Balancing chemical equations. Predicting the type of chemical reaction. And acids and bases. If you want to jump to a particular chapter, scroll down to the description box down below and you'll see the corresponding time codes. Also beside the time codes are the corresponding homework worksheets, and if you scroll down a little bit further below, you'll see the answer key. Now when you do your homework, make sure that you honestly do the homework, don't just blatantly copy off the answer key. Hey, I'm gonna finish this in no time. Because really, at the end of the day, you're only cheating yourself. Now if you want to speed up the video by a bit, feel free to hit the shift button and greater than the sign. And if you want to slow down the video by a bit, then hit the shift button followed by the less than sign. Alternatively, you can click on the cog wheel on the bottom right hand side and adjust the play speed as necessary. Without further ado, let's get started in the kingdom of chemistry. Firstly, the elements are arranged on the periodic table according to the number of protons that each element has, from least to most. For example, hydrogen only has one proton, so it is placed first on the table. Next, helium has two protons in it, so it's placed to the right of hydrogen. Not here, but all the way over here, and that is because helium shares something in common with the other elements in this last column. Secondly, the periodic table is arranged in a way such that elements with similar properties are lined up vertically with one another. Since lithium shares something in common with hydrogen, the periodic list is reset to the left and the lithium is placed down below hydrogen. Beryllium, with four protons, is placed next to lithium. And then there's this huge gap before you continue with boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and finally neon. Then the period list resets again. Sodium shares something in common with lithium and hydrogen. The same is also true for potassium, rubidium, and cesium. Since these elements share something in common with one another, they're given a family name called alkali metals. Just like how you, your siblings, and your cousins somewhat look alike, you all share the same last name as well. In group 2, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, and barium all share something in common, and they're known as the family of alkaline earth metals. In the second last column, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and astatine are the most reactive of non-metals and are given the family name the halogens. In large doses, these elements are toxic to your body. In the last column, you'll find the most non-reactive elements in the periodic table. Helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. These are known as a family of inert gases, meaning non-reactive gases. They're also known as noble gases, as these elements stand apart from the rest and don't react with other elements. Another notable pattern is that all metallic elements or metals can be found on the left side of the periodic table, and non-metals can be found on the right. Also, there are seven elements in the middle that sometimes behave as a metal and sometimes as a non-metal. These elements are given the family name metalloids. One of the most notable metalloid is silicon, which is a foundational element in all modern electronic devices, and it can behave like a switch and either behave like a metal and conduct or behave like a non-metal and prevent electrical current flow. That's a fun fact you can share around the dinner table tonight. Each cell of a periodic table can contain a lot of information about each element. But for the simplicity of grade 10, let's focus on four attributes. The number on the top left corner of the cell is the atomic number, and it indicates the number of protons an element has. The big capital letter in the middle is known as the chemical symbol. If there is a second letter to the symbol, it must be placed in lowercase. For example, cobalt must be written as capital C, lowercase o. If you accidentally write capital C, capital O, that would mean carbon oxygen, or carbon monoxide, the deadly orderless gas. Keep in mind that science is an international language, so no matter which country you might be watching this video from, capital C, lowercase o, is universally known as cobalt, and capital C, capital O, is universally known as carbon monoxide. Are we zero Kelvin with that? Below the symbol is the chemical name. Some periodic tables use British English spelling, and others use American English spelling. Lastly, the bottom number is a very precise atomic mass. The atomic mass is the sum of the number of protons and number of neutrons. As you might have learned last year, it is impossible to have half a proton or even a fraction of a neutron. 
Let me give you an example. Let's say the average number of students in a classroom is 24.5. Does that mean that in every classroom, you'll find 24 full-bodied students and half a student sitting in one of the seats? Instead, 24.5 means that sometimes you might find 24 students in a classroom, and sometimes you might find 25. This year, let's just keep it simple. For the purposes of grade 10, let's round the atomic mass to the nearest whole and call it a day. Take a look at the worksheet, link in the description box below. Only some of the periodic numbers are labeled. In fact, the seventh row, or seventh period, is missing. The numbered boxes are the only elements you're responsible for in this course. Please pause this video right now and fill in the symbol, chemical name, and rounded atomic mass for all of these 44 elements. Press the spacebar to pause the video or tap pause on your touch screen. Did you fill in the table like this? Good. On to the next topic. In 1913, Niels Bohr and Ernest Rutherford teamed together to present a new way of showcasing the internal structure of an atom. The center circle contained the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus of an atom, and each subsequent circle outside indicated the quantity of electrons orbiting the nucleus. Each electron shell can hold a certain quantity of electrons, and each shell must be completely full before the next shell can be drawn. The first shell can hold a maximum of two electrons. The second shell can hold a maximum of eight. The third shell can hold a maximum of eight. And the fourth shell, well, things start to get messy here. In any case, whichever shell that is the outermost shell, it's given a special name, the valence shell. Since the atomic mass is the sum of the protons and neutrons, the number of neutrons is the atomic mass minus protons. Let's work on some Bohr-Rutherford examples together. We will assume that the elements are neutrally charged, so it will share the same number of protons as electrons. Potassium is element number 19. It has an atomic mass of 39.1, rounded down to 39. Since the element number is 19, there are 19 protons and 19 electrons to make it neutral. Since number of neutrons is equal to the atomic mass minus the atomic number, 39 minus 19 equals 20 neutrons. Therefore, the nucleus of the potassium contains 19 protons and 20 neutrons. The first electron shell will max out at 2 electrons. The next shell will max out at 8. So far we have 10. The next shell will max out at 8. That gives us 18. So we'll need one more in the fourth shell to add up to 19 electrons in total. So here we have the completed Bohr-Rutherford diagram with one electron in the outermost shell, which is called the, yep, the valence shell. Good job. Now let's draw the Bohr-Rutherford diagram with magnesium. Magnesium is element number 12 and has an atomic mass of 24.3, rounded down to 24. So magnesium has 12 protons, 12 electrons, and 24 minus 12 gives us 12 neutrons. The first shell has two electrons. The second shell has eight electrons, giving us a subtotal of 10. So the third one must have two more to add up to 12. Pause the video and try out the next four below on your own. Do your diagrams match up with the answer key? Good job! For more adventures like this, make sure that you finish your homework each night and check your answers with the answer key. Until our next adventure together.